Sears, so I'm going to get I'm going to get started before everybody moves on to something else. But I, I want to thank everybody for coming out to a uh, bookstore in a mall to hear a guy talk about nature and nature writing. So <laughs> appreciate it. I have a little ceramic fire going here to set the mood for everybody. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but uh, the, the book is looking for hickories of forgotten wild I'm good, the forgotten wildness of the rural Midwest. And uh, it's not a, kind of self-explanatory, but when I was sitting down to try to come up with some uh, concept what the book is really all about, uh, one word came to me that really defines it for me, and that word is, uh, is noumenon, and that's not a common word, but it's a word that uh, Aldo Leopold uses in his landmark book, um, uh, Sand County Almanac. And, you know, he's the grandfather, godfather of the whole ecology green movement. And noumenon, as, as Leopold used it, I haven't heard anybody else use it, it's like the word phenomenon. You know, we know a phenomenon is sort of a special event or a happening or some, you know, you hear about a phenomenon of a new star basketball player, a new product on the market or some place. But for Leopold, noumenon is a combination of that. It's, it starts with the word noumen, which is a, a Roman word, N-U-M-E-N, and it refers to this sort of spirit that's an indwelling that you would find, you know, like in a, in a sacred grove of trees or a waterfall or maybe a mountain. And the Romans, as they built their you know, massive road network across Europe, in different places they would make these little shrines to, to the resident spirit, the Newman. And for, um, for Leopold, the Numenon was really a natural creature that evokes that sort of same sense of sort of indwelling and, and mastery, you know. And he, and he would, uh, the certain places that he visited, and he traveled wildly, he's an incredible guy. And uh, maybe it would be down the Sea of Cortez and it would be some sort of wild, wildfowl. Or, or, of course, you know, his famous uh, essay, Think Like a Mountain, it was a wolf that, that he had shot because that's what you did back then with predators, and he saw that green fire and the wolf's eyes die away, and he saw that that wolf really encapsulated what was great about that mountain. And, you know, we think about Michigan, of course, one thing that comes to mind up north is the loon. I mean, it's, it's sort of been over-commercialized, but if you've been up north and if you've seen this the loon, this, uh, this, you know, this black and white diving bird with these beautiful ruby red eyes, and you've heard them, call at night, you know, on a, on a lake in the UP when there's lily pads are out there and the, the orange gold sun is set behind a screen of black pine trees. I mean, it, it just really, it really encapsulates everything that's wild about the place, you know. And, uh, and I think it, it, when I look at the, what I think people are missing in their life, it's sort of that, that connection that probably the, the Romans had and uh, people did, you know, basically before the last, you know, 75, 50 years or so where people lived their lives in a way that they were connected on a regular basis with, with these these aspects of the local natural world that really made sense to them, that really helped them feel rooted, you know. And uh, so I was thinking coming up here, I was thinking this morning, so if I'm coming to East Lansing, you know, what 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 what, what would be a noumenon for this area? What would be really be symbolic of it? And I cut this little sprig of greenery, <coughs> and this comes out of a, uh, this comes out of a, uh, one, of, one of my favorite trees, it comes out of a red cedar tree, okay, this is an eastern red cedar tree. Uh, some foresters will say this is sort of a, uh, it's a trash tree, it's a weed tree, because it grows in sort of these harsh places where there's poor soil or not much water. But it's, real, it's really a pretty tree. It has sort of a column-shaped form, and it has this sort of spiny, rough green growth. And, of course, it's an evergreen, so it's, it's, it's you know, grows green throughout the year. And, um, and then we know what cedar is, of course. It's this beautiful aromatic wood, you know. When, when you're a kid growing up, maybe your mom had a cedar chest where she would keep her blankets, you know. So this... This tree, I don't know when, probably back in the 1800s, somebody around here was connected enough to the local landscape to uh, say, you know what, this is, there's this major body of water here in, in, in East Lansing, and we're going to name it after this thing. But anyway, so I think these trees are cool, and I, I got this idea that I, when I got my old uh, farmhouse in 1995, that I wanted to sort of uh, uh, somehow participate or honor, in these, honor these trees and help us sort of, you know, help them survive some way. And, and what really gave me this idea was I saw an article in one of the Detroit papers about um, how in the western Detroit suburbs or outer ring suburbs, wherever they may be, you know, people, this, is, this was like late 90s, people are building these, these big mansions. So these are half a million dollar, million dollar houses. You know, and all of a sudden, you know, they're out in the middle of a cornfield. You got this grand, majestic house, and you go to landscape, and they have these like broomstick-sized, you know, saplings out front. 
You know, and if you're a person of means, that will never do. You're not going to have that. You're not going to wait around for 20 years to get a shade tree. So they will hire landscapers who have, you probably seen these big, huge spade trucks, and they can move, you know, trees that are like 8, 10 inches in diameter, you know, that are 30, 40 feet tall. Of course, it costs five, ten thousand 10000 a piece, but again, if you, you know, if you got the money, that's what you do. You, you Damn it, you're going to have a tree there tomorrow morning, you know, a shade tree. So I decided to do something different, and I... Uh, I said, well, I'm going I'm to grow my own trees. I'm going to be president of creation, man. I'm going to collect the little seedlings and acorns and just grow them themselves. You know, if I can't have big ones, I'll have, I can't have the biggest ones. I'll have the smallest ones. <laughs> That's my logic. So, so I'll pick it up here. Raising trees from scratch is an inexpensive hobby, and filling cartons with soil and seed is a relaxing way to pass an evening. As hobbies go, microforestry doesn't require <laughs> special equipment, clothing, instruction, or user fees. But there is a catch. In modern America, such an anti-consumptive pastime may mark you as a suspicious character. On a Sunday afternoon, I went to gather acorns from an ancient borough along US 131, a busy four-lane highway in southwest Michigan. This magnificent tree has a craggy crown that evokes the gnarled wisdom and splendor of an Old Testament prophet. Given its size, the tree must have borne witness to Indian hunting parties, pioneer wagons, and the boundless flocks of passenger pigeons that once darkened the Midwestern sky. I was so happily absorbed by these thoughts that I never saw the bright blue sedan pull up. Excuse me, sir, can I ask you what you're doing? The state trooper asked. Well, I'm gathering acorns, I said. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plant them and grow my own trees. <laughs> he looked at me with a mixture of amusement and pity. Somewhat flustered, I rambled on about the beautiful Baroque and how saving its, acor saving its acorn, acorns would allow me to propagate its progeny. You know, he said, looking past my shoulder as the cars and trucks zipped by, I drive by that tree every day, but I guess I'm just too busy to notice that kind of thing. He told me to be careful around traffic, which probably seemed like a necessary precaution when you're dealing with a middle-aged man who gets excited about acorns. <laughs> so is it legal to harvest service berries or any other fruit from trees that grow on public property? I've never heard anyone say you can't. But you can expect some odd looks as you hover around trees whose primary purpose is corporate landscaping. I've heard them compared elsewhere to it's like corporate tofu, right? These things are there, but they don't really, not supposed to have any flavor or touch. But So when I'm out gleaning wild edibles during my lunch hour, a typical exchange goes like this. Excuse me, sir, what is that you're picking? They're called service berries. Want to try one? Service bears. Hmm. Never heard of them. Are they poisonous? <laughs> Say, no, I, I try to avoid eating poisonous food. <laughs> but do you want to try one? At this point, about half the bystanders will try a service berry for themselves. And once they do, they're pleasantly surprised. But how could they not be? Service berries have a rich, complex flavor that any gourmand would love. And technically, they're not berries at all, but really tiny apples. You just had one, so I'll stop there. I'm sure you've heard about invasive species. They're a big class of stuff that used to grow somewhere else. It was a wild thing, and now it came over here, and it comes over here, and it doesn't have any sort of competition, so it goes nuts, right? Okay, you know, you have, like, these ships coming up the St. Lawrence Seaway who, in their ballast tanks, they have, like, these zebra mussels, and they get in our water supply, and all of a sudden they're everywhere, all over docks and boats and feet, and, you know, you've seen these pipes lake area that are eight feet wide and they're clogged with these things, you know. So obviously they do a lot of damage. Or you've seen the, in the swamps, you've seen purple loose stripe. It looks like a beautiful plant, but it's because it's taken everything out and it's choking out the native cattails. You know, and, and you know, you can think back and back to even starlings and house sparrows, things we take for granted now. But, um, so okay, I can sort of bought into that. And then uh, I got this four acres and I want to do a restored prairie because that was what used to be here back in the 1830s, 1840s. And I started talking to these nature people who are like and respect about this, and they're really mellow types, you know, and won't hurt a fly, Quakers and whatnot. When they start talking about invasive species, man, they're like, you know, they sound like Himmler or something. They're like, you've got to destroy them. You know, you've got to go in and, and you've just got to, you know, the really rad radical thing, they sort of humanize, you know, their opposition to these things. I understand that they are dangerous, but that's a little bit scary. So. I was trying to weigh in my mind, you know, how, how you sort of resolve the two, because when I went out in this place where I wanted to uh, put this prairie on it, or, or plant this prairie, it was about an eighth of an acre, not a big spot, but it had been farmed and whatever, you know, for a long time, and and I, and I did some, and, I, and I'm not an expert, but I counted about seven or eight native plants, okay, so these are native prairie plants that were there, 
like since the Ice Age or something, you know, I didn't just buy them in a nursery, they were all here. But according to the, uh, you know, based on, on the prevailing dogma, what I had to do just seemed sort of countercultural. So uh, uh, this is how I, this is how I sort of, this is me sort of talking out loud how I, how I dealt with that. Uh, so, ah, but here's the irony. If I'm to create a real prairie, then all this has to go. In so many words, I've been told by prairie restoration experts that I'll need to destroy my existing prairie in order to save it. And from a technical standpoint, they are exactly right. If you want a historically correct prairie, a piece of tall grass heaven just like the one that Laura Ingalls Wilder wrote about, then you'll need to do plenty of killing and tilling. <laughs> you must first spray herbicide, exterminate every living plant, and then till under the dead remains. You should then repeat this kill and till cycle for one or two growing seasons as necessary until every, every fugitive seed and shoot has shriveled into submission. <laughs> Only after Mother Earth cries uncle is it safe to plant your all-natural prairie. And so I'm, I'm going on to think about what we consider exotics because some of these exotics, you know, as for the exotics, I'm not fond of them either, but some have been here for like 170 years, much longer than my human kin. We know that plants communicate via chemical means and maybe they've found a symbiotic way to coexist with the natives. They may even provide benefits that we've yet to understand. So at what point do these naturalized foreigners earn their botanical green card? So those are the type of things you deal with when it's the either or. In my approach, which I get into more here, is that I just take these things out. And it's unscientific, but I, I, I try to enrich instead of eradicate. So in practice, I buy plat, flats of native grasses and wildflowers and plant them randomly, you know, as possible in a little prairie. And after a few weeks of initial watering, they're on their own. It's a tough love approach, but life on a prairie isn't for the weak or wilt prone. This is the 21st century, and if the natives can't hack it, then their ecological duties may be outsourced to some hardy honeysuckle bush from western Ukraine. <laughs> <laughs> so you got to come back here and make it. you got to earn your way. Three miles from Dayton's orchard, there's a big supermarket where we used to buy FDA-approved juice boxes for our children. One day, after reading the label, I decided that this was no longer a good idea. What convinced me was this disclaimer. This carton may contain apple juice from the USA, Argentina, Chile, Germany, or Austria. May contain. Not does contain or will contain, but may contain. Had the lawyers who wrote this been injected with truth serum, perhaps it would have said something like this. We, the rootless corporation that produces product, have only the vaguest idea of where your food came from. <laughs> but if bad apples poison the juice, we're reasonably confident that we can narrow down our source to three of the world's seven continents. <laughs> <laughs> so call me middle-aged crotchety, but I'll take my chances with Dayton's fresh cider any day. Uh -huh. I know it comes from fruit that he's planted, tended, and feeds his own family. For me, that's assurance enough. Because a life that strives for zero risk is a lot like pasteurized cider. It has little color, even less flavor, and a bad aftertaste that makes you long for the real thing. <laughs>